So welcome to part two of our elder abuse training. Um, if you suspect something, say something. So this is part two about the signs and ageism itself. So we'll start with understanding elder abuse. So elder abuse is a complex issue and some of its complexity arises from the fact that uh, it sits within long-standing family relationships and often butts up against an older person's, um, you know, parenting responsibilities. It's hard for them to call out bad behaviour. Um, elder abuse comes in many forms um, and it doesn't discriminate, but there's common factors that can increase the risk of elder abuse and we'll talk a little bit more about those later. But isolation is a big risk factor for elder abuse. There's some signs of elder abuse that you can spot and we're really keen to talk about those because you are our community spotters and you help link your clients to our service. Thanks, Mary. So now we might just talk about what some of those signs of abuse are. So some of the signs are, first off, it could be changes to a will. So there might be pressure on the older person to change their will or they might be changing it in suspicious circumstances. Um, it might be that it's, they don't appear to have capacity to change their will. Other signs might be an empty fridge. Uh, you might be thinking the older person isn't getting enough food. So if their cupboards and their fridge are empty, a big question is, are they getting enough food? It might be if they have no money to pay for things when they should. So if you know the older person's in receipt of a pension, but they can't afford the basic necessities of life, a big question there is, where is the money going and why don't they have access to it? One sign might be that the older person doesn't know how much money they have or where their money is. So you might ask them what bank they're with and they might not know. This can be a sign of elder abuse, but it's not always the case. Sometimes the older person hands over financial control where they just prefer not to have to deal with it anymore. It's something to look into further uh, because it is still a sign of elder abuse. The older person might become withdrawn and be more sad, depressed and display anxiety. This can often be the case where they're experiencing psychological abuse. So if they're getting emotional, emotional abuse, harassment, uh, threatening behaviour or being spoken down to, they can display some of these emotions. Um, as well as that, there can be fear, in particular if they're getting threats or if they're experiencing physical abuse. And a key sign of that might be injuries. There's also a change in their self-esteem. So a once confident person might suddenly cut themselves off from the world. And it might be because they're experiencing abuse and they don't want people to know about it. They might complain about their needs not being met. And sometimes it can be easy to ignore people when they're complaining. But we're asking that you don't ignore it out of hand, that you give consideration. Sometimes an older person will be telling you that they don't have everything they need, that they are being abused or neglected, and we just need to listen to them. There might be unexplained weight loss, which might connect to an empty fridge and kitchen, which is the older person isn't getting the food they need. Or there might be poor personal hygiene, where they're being neglected and there's no one providing them with care. So whether you're a family member, a friend, a neighbour, a carer or working with older people, it's everybody's business to look out for the older people in our lives and to just keep an eye out for these things. You don't have to be cautious and suspicious of every single person, but just keep an eye out for these types of signs, which may be signs that the older person is suffering from some form of elder abuse. So Mary, what are some of those risk factors that uh, make elder abuse more prominent? There's a few things that as community workers you can be alert to. So one of the things that we do know is that isolation can be a real risk factor for elder abuse. Um, perhaps you might reflect on what's happened during COVID in that often older people are um, confined to their house, often with their abuser because we know that most abusers are family. Um, and we also know that face-to-face -face services have been reduced, so their isolation has increased. Um, along with that, there, uh, there can be increased responsibility for the carer. Most carers, you know, go into it with all the best of intentions um, to look after that older person and provide services to them. But sometimes other things can happen or the older person can have increased needs that can place an enormous amount of stress on the carer. And as community workers, 
it's really helpful if you can spot that care or stress because you can help the older person by linking that carer in with some support to enable them to be able to better care for the old per- older person. So changes in living conditions are also a risk factor. You need to sort of think about, you know, is the housing that the older person is now in, is that suitable for them? Are there risks within that housing? You know, have they got access to a bathroom? Have they got access to a kitchen? Um, Are the living conditions clean? Uh, We know that financial hardship is also a a risk factor. Um, Increased family obligations and stress generally is a risk factor for elder abuse. So there's a big problem we know with older people reporting on behalf of themselves. And as far as I'm aware, one of those reasons is that a lot of older people may not think that what they're going through could be classified as abuse or as a crime. It's just something that they, you know, they may be a parent and they're just, they've always cared for their child and giving their child money or something like that has just been an extension of that care for the child. So that's one of my understandings of why older people may not report. But Tanya, could you speak more to that? Yeah, no, absolutely. So there is that protective love where um, older people might think it's just natural to provide a child with financial support to help them look after grandchildren, to assist them in whatever way they can because they see that as their role. Um, The other side of that of the protective love is also where the older person doesn't want any negative action to come against the child. So they might not report the child as being abusive or taking money or property because they don't want the child to suffer any consequences. They might not want criminal action to be taken against the child and they might not themselves want to make any accusations against the child. So protective love appears to be a strong factor in why older people don't report. Another one is dependence. So when people get older, they do become more dependent on others for their care. And if you're reliant on someone to care for you and make sure that you get food and you're cleaned and you're able to be taken to the services you need, someone taking you to the doctor, someone helping you go out to have lunch with friends, you depend on them. So you might not want that person taken out of your life or you might not want to do anything that risks that relationship. So the older person might not want to take any action because they lose the person caring for them. There's always family loyalty, uh, which is a big factor where you've got to be loyal to family members and keep secrets in the family and also maintain family relationships. Where you have abuse, often the solution can cause a breakdown in relationships So if the older person doesn't want to lose that relationship, they might be willing to put up with abuse. There can be fear of retaliation or punishment. So an older person might say, I'm not going to report them to the police because it will only make them angrier and then I'll have to deal with them. So there is that risk of retaliation that if they take any action at all, it's just going to make things worse. There's the fear of abandonment. that The family member might just cut off contact with them. Older people might also not be aware of their options or rights. So where it's not a clear-cut crime, they might think that there's nothing that can be done, that they, there's no way to get their money back, that there's no way that they can stand up for themselves so they're not spoken to in an abusive manner. Our service is here to be able to help the older person identify that they do have options and rights. As Mary touched on, uh, social isolation is a big factor here. And it can often be that where the older person is isolated, they don't know that help is out there and they don't reach out for assistance, which is why we rely on community workers so much. They're our contact with those older people so that they can help the older person identify that they're being abused and they can help link the older person in with services like ours that can provide assistance. There might be a history of domestic and family violence and often where that is the case, the older person might not see it as something that needs to change. It could be something they're used to so they don't realise that it needs to be broken and that they should be seeking help. Uh, The same can be for cultural and language barriers that the person might see some behaviour as just part of their culture and not realise that it can be abusive and that they don't need to put up with it. 
With older people, there's always the risk of impaired capacity. Sometimes where an older person has impaired capacity, they rely more than ever on the people around them to help identify the abuse and to draw it to other people's attention, to report it and to help that older person because they can't help themselves. And I think finally, the there is the fear of not being believed. And this might be most predominant in sexual elder abuse. Um, it is highly underreported and it can most likely be because the older person doesn't feel that they're going to be believed if they report that someone has sexually abused them. It also applies to the other forms of abuse that are harder to identify, like emotional abuse and neglect. They might feel that if they don't have proof, then no one's going to believe them. A lot of these reasons why people don't report and a lot of what we've already spoken about stems from something that um, is a bit bigger in society, which is something that we call ageism. And ageism, Mary, you've put this really well before. So ageism is stereotyping, discrimination and mistreatment based solely upon age. So it can play out with things like attributing memory lapses to age, presuming there's a loss of capacity in the older person to make the decision, um, making decisions for the older person that result in a loss of privacy and control, things like speaking down to the older person or speaking in a patronising way to the older person. So ageism acts as a type of prejudice that has a direct link to elder abuse because it does two things. So number one, it justifies abusive behaviour against the older person. And number two, so one of my observations since working in this service is that ageism sits behind elder abuse in a similar way to disrespect can sit behind domestic violence. And it's up to us to challenge our own ageist beliefs and call it out when we see it. Very good lead in to our next slide. We just wanted, there's a wonderful website called Every Age Counts, which has a quiz on it, which allows you to go through and challenge your own ageist thoughts and views. And I did it myself and I realised that I do have ageist thoughts and beliefs and have now changed the way that I speak and think and am trying to change that every day. And that's something that we're trying to get from you guys and from everyone that we speak to is just to start thinking about the way that we behave in our regular lives, in our community and challenge our own beliefs about old people um, and about ageism. So here is just a couple of ageist thoughts and beliefs that I picked up from all of the websites that I was looking at for the research for these training webinars. So we'll read through them now and have a think about whether you've ever said any of these or whether any of these uh, you've heard yourselves and whether you think they are ageist or not. Old people are useless and boring. Young people are prettier. Old people have more accidents and fall over all the time. They are less effective workers. They are slow, don't understand computers. Wrinkles are ugly and unattractive. Old people shouldn't make their own choices. They don't know what's best. Old people shouldn't be driving. They're slow and have more accidents. Older people have nothing to offer. Old people are cute and sweet, like that cute little old lady across the street. They don't like to celebrate birthdays. Old people are often deaf, blind, slow and forgetful. Computers and mobile phones confuse them. Old people having sex is gross. Old people are a drain on our society. They get a pension and lots of free health care. All old people have dementia. Old people can't learn new things. Are there any other ageist comments or thoughts that have stuck with you from your work in this space? When you're working with older people who are experiencing abuse, it can often be difficult to fight your protective instincts where you want to jump in and protect them and encourage them to protect themselves. And sometimes in trying so hard to make them safe, you forget that they are adults who have rights and can make decisions for themselves. So even if the older person wants to make a decision that you don't agree with, Sometimes you need to step back and respect that decision. Where the older person has capacity to make decisions, it should be respected. 
We can encourage them to seek assistance. We can provide them with all the information they need to make informed decisions. But at the end of the day, you need to let them have control of their own lives and make decisions for themselves. And just following on from that, you should always presume that an older person does have capacity to make decisions. And there's things that you can do to support that person to be able to be at their best to be able to make those decisions. And you should be thinking about ways that you can do that. You know, when we're working with older people, I always think about what time of the day are they, you know, most alert? Who do they need to be with them to be able to make decisions? What's the best situation for me to see them in? So, you know, it might be face to face or they might not be able to be at their best over the phone. So it's all the time thinking about what's the best way to be able to support an older person to make the best possible decisions, assuming that they have capacity to do that. Okay, thank you so much for joining us for part two. Um, As always, if you wanted to get in touch with us, please contact us at elderservice at legalaid.newsouthwales.gov.au. Um, If you or someone you know is experiencing elder abuse, please call 1800 Elder Help or 1800 353 374 or have a look on the compass.info website for more resources and information. So our next part, part three, we're going to be exploring some case studies and having a look at how this acts out in uh, real time.